We've been dealing with 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the first five verses for several weeks now concerning spiritual warfare. About the tearing down of the doctrines of demons. Going up against Satan's strongholds. And this is dealing with the church as a whole. This warfare is concerning the church as a whole doing battle, you know, in the, in the world, with the world system and so forth. And, and we'll explain that in just a second, but we're getting ready to enter into Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Now, when we get into Ephesians, the sixth chapter, it's still spiritual warfare, but now we're going to be dealing with that on a personal level. That which the powers and the principalities and things that comes against us in a personal way in relationship to our home and our workplace, in relationship even to our families, to our neighbors, and even to our, our uh, city and so forth that we dwell in. But in second in the 10th chapter, it's a different type of warfare that we've been talking about. It, Paul describes that we are up against these fortresses, of these strongholds. In fact, uh, let me read it to you. He says uh, that we don't walk in the flesh, we do not walk uh, unspiritually, because our, warfare, our weapons are warfare, not carnal, but they're mighty. Mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, some translates this as fortresses. And then he tells us what those strongholds and these fortresses are. They're casting down imaginations and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, this covers our, our culture, it covers our society, it covers our government, it, it, it covers this world. Think about it. Every thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we're to bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. And last week, we dealt with the word that Paul uses here, and I, I cannot pronounce it, it's logismus or something like that, but he, he, it defines as speculations. It's defined as the thoughts and the ideas, the opinions, the reasonings, the philosophies of this world, the theories of this world, the ideologies of this world, even the religions of this world. You know that's 4,200 different religions in this world? It is the world system that opposes God because we live in an anti-God, anti-Christ world that opposes God. I brought out that when I was a child I've been brought up that you respected the church, you respected people in the church, you respected the pastors and the ministers, you had prayer in the school, you could share Jesus, and if you walk up to someone who was using profanity or something and they knew you was a Christian, they would stop speaking it. If you walk up to someone and they might have a beer or something in their hand, they would put it behind you. Uh, we, 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 but now we live in a different culture, uh, an anti-God, an anti-Christ world. And we see it very, a whole lot, listen to me, in the political realm. We see it in our schools. We see it in our universities. We see these strongholds because they have to do with the thoughts, the ideas, the concepts, the opinions of an anti-Christ culture. And I read to you what one wrote. He said, the most influential intellectuals today, the most influential philosophers, scientists, educators, and politicians of today, judges of today in America, are anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible, and anti-family. And these people control our courts, they control our government, they control our universities. And listen to me, they are ruled by the prince of this world. Jesus acknowledged him, if you remember last week as we look at it, that he acknowledged that Satan, three times in the book of John alone, he acknowledges that Satan is the prince of this world. Paul acknowledges that he has become the God of this world. And so he rules through man. You see, he cannot rule but through man. See, the earth doesn't belong to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullest of us. But God gave man, and we'll see that in a minute, dominion, authority in the earth, and now Satan took that dominion, and now he rules through man. And so every concept of man, every opinion, every reason, every philosophy, every theory, every ideology, every thought that is against God, we are to tear down. 
And yet instead of turning that down, we put these very people who oppose us, outstanding Christ, who we stand for in the church, we elect them and make them officials over us. And they tell us, who believe in God, who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are just, you know, irrational. That we are dangerous to that freedom. I've had people to write me on, on Facebook to message me and tell me that when I talk about gospel, when I talk about Jesus Christ, when I talk about Christianity, that I'm very irrational. That there are other religions out there and that there are other ways that we can worship God. And people follow that. They say that I'm a danger to that freedom and, I much, and that the church must only be allowed to have a limited influence on public discourse. That we must have a limited influence on the public culture. And that as Christians, you and I have been deceived into believing that God has no place in the public life. God has no place in education. That God has no place in government or social policy or in making laws or in our courts or in determining our morality. And some even go as far as to state that, they have no, that, that, that we have no place even in raising our very own children. And all this rejection of God is purported now to be intellectual, to be scientific. Have you heard those words being used now? On, even over our media and, even, and, and social media too? That, that all of this is reported to be intellectual, to be scientific, and to be freedom-loving, that we are a danger to the freedom of the people in these beloved United States that we live in. Let me tell you what it is, really. It's simply a love for sin. And we've sat back as a church and we've allowed it. We've helped put these people in charge of the world that we live in. Because remember, we look at Genesis 1.26. And we, and, 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 uh, how many sermons have I heard preached from Genesis 1.26? How many of you? Quite, quite a lot, heavily. But when he says that he's given the dominion to man, the authority to man, that, that word uh, uh, that, that Jesus, that is used here even in uh, 2 Corinthians, that word is ex osia. Now, I, I mean, I don't know if I said it right. But that's the way I pronounce it. You look it up and say it the way you pronounce it the way you want to. But I can tell you, it means dominion. It means power. It means authority. It means domain. It means control. And listen to this. It means jurisdiction. It means the power to rule over, to govern, the authority to manage the affairs of the nation and of creation. That was given to man in Genesis 1, 26. In other words, we ought to be in charge of politics. The governments of the world. We ought to be in charge uh, of education. We ought to be in charge of the health care system. That we, as the children of God, that God gave it to man. Man still has it. Man still has that authority. That power. He still uses it. But it's the principality that's behind it. You want to know who that principality is? Go to Ezekiel 28, chapter. The first 11 verses has to do with the king. Uh, uh, I believe, what is it? Uh, Tyra. It talks about his rule and how that he has set himself up as God, that he knows more than God. That, and he even mentioned that he has such great wisdom and intellect. Then it pulls back the curtain. And now we see the spirit being behind it. Lucifer, Satan, that angel that rebelled against God. Go to Isaiah, the 14th chapter. It starts out speaking about the king of Babylon and his greatness and so forth and his denial of God and all and, and how that he is some great God of the world. But then when it removes the curtain we see again this being called lucifer that's behind it we see it in operation in the new testament we saw why when jesus christ was sharing the gospel was sharing his very purpose with his disciples of why he came he was rebuked jesus the very son of god he was rebuked peter said oh no 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 lord that that's not the way he's going to be that's not the way it's going to happen and jesus looked at peter and he didn't say peter you don't say the things of god he didn't say peter i rebuke you he looked behind Peter. He saw the being that was using Peter to speak out against the very purposes of God. And he said, Satan, I rebuke thee. You see, there's a God of this world who, who's exercising this power, trying to create this anti-God, this anti-Christ nation. And we saw how that he got that power through trickery, through deception. He took it from man. Adam sinned against God, and in doing so, he placed not only himself, but the entire human race under the dominion of Satan, sin, and death. And that's the warfare that Paul tells us in Corinthians, the 10th chapter, that we are again up against. In Luke, the 4th chapter, we saw this. 
Jesus was showing the nations of the world. Remember I said this last week? I'm just kind of reiterate this before I move into the sixth chapter of, of Ephesians. But he, he told him, he said, all this, remember, I said, has been delivered to me. Some translates it, has been handed over to me. It means the same. But when you read it in the context of how it was written in the original language, you, you, you see, remember again, you, you see this in a minute again, that's only, uh, th that's two-thirds more descriptive words in the English language than in the, I mean, in the, uh, Hebrew and the Greek language and in the English language, and so they had to find the best word that was suited here. And so they used that word delivered. Some use it word that it was handed over. But when you go deep into the meaning of that word in its original meaning, it means to hand over through trickery. In other words, Satan was saying, this was delivered to me through trickery, through trickery and deception, but it still belongs to me. I still have it. And Jesus did not argue with him one bit. Jesus did not deny that he did not have that authority. What Jesus did do is say, listen, I'm still the Lord. I'm still Lord God. And thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only. He was telling Satan, you're still my devil. I, I'm still Lord, even your Lord over you. And, and we read, but that, what I want you to realize is that Satan, 1 John 5, 19, he, he controls men, but is ungodly men. It, it, it's men who are depraved. And they're now rule. They rule in our universities. They rule in, in, in our uh, government and so forth. And we, the Bible says, concerning this world order of things, we are not to be of this world. Jesus said over, what was it, over in John, uh, in several places, that we was to be in the world, but we were not of the world. He said in John uh, in 1 John 2, 15 through 16, he describes that this world, that's an anti-God culture, its philosophies, its ideologies, its reasons and opinions. See, we, we remember, it's not talking about the people of the world. We're to love them. But we're not to love the world system. Because as Christians, we are no longer under this world's order. We operate according to God's kingdom laws and principles, and therefore we are at odds at the world many times, even in the political realm. We are not of the world but we're still in the world. And therefore, until Jesus Christ comes and set up his millennium reign, the church is, and the church must take a stand against all things that exhaust itself against God. And Jesus said, when you do, he's going to hate you. Jesus pointed out because the world hated him, it hates us. And he points out that we will suffer for it. He points it out in John 15, 18 through 22, and John 17, 14 through 17. In John 16, 33, he even tells us because of his hatred that we will be severely tested, persecuted. That would be great tribulation, but he tells us not to fear it. So, my friend, I'm just going to pause right here and ask that you be sure who you stand with, who you support, and who you're going to vote for. And I'm not saying to vote for any particular person. I'm saying, look at what you stand for in your biblical principles. See, we are not to wage war in an unspiritual way. We are to wage war by rejecting evil, by making known the truth of God. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, John 8, 22, by uh, John 8, 32. We do warfare by staying sin against sin and iniquity. Iniquity is, imp is perversion. Iniquity is uncleanness. We raise war by standing against ungodliness. See, this is what Nord and his family did. This is what they had to endure for 120 years. You see, Jude said over in his book that there were angels, fallen angels, who left their proper domain. In John the 6th chapter, they referred to as sons of God. Five times they referred, it refers to sons of God in the Old Testament as angels. And they came down cohabited with the doors of men, and they perverted the human race. Genesis 6, 5. And then after the fifth verse, you, you read following that God looked down and stated that all of man had become contaminated by this perversion. Only Noah found grace because he alone was perfect in his generation, which is not talking about his character. As you'll find out later, his character was a little marred. I mean, he got drunk. He, he, he did some things that he shouldn't have did, but the fact of it is he was talking about his he was still made in the image and the likeness of God. And everyone else on the planet of Earth, the human race, had became perverted into an unholy, ungodly race and creation. And God had destroyed them. 
And Jude tells us and Peter tells us that those spirits are reserved in chains in the very pits of hell. And yet today, again, we see what is happening. Man trying to pervert God's creation. Try to, try to, that we think we can go in and change what God created us to be. That if you tired of being a male, you can pervert yourself and become a female and vice versa. And we see, and we have laws passed and they say, you know what? Even if a child's eight years old, they can do it. We wage warfare against everything that exalts itself above God and his standards of holiness by obeying God's laws above hell. We ought, listen, to obey the laws of the land. We ought to until they're contrary to God's laws. Remember Daniel and the three Hebrew children? They, they, they were obedient to the kings that reigned over them. And they were exalted and given favor. But then there came a command that they were to worship a graven image. It came a, a command that they were to worship idols. And they would not bow their knee. They refused to. And God stood with them. And I want you to know when we refuse to bow our knees to these idols. And you say, oh, listen, I know in other parts of the world there are idols. There are people who worship uh, idols that are created out of, out of different materials and things. And you say, but we don't worship idols in the United States. Oh, yes, we do. I remind that this morning I told the story of a gentleman who had escaped Russia when it was under communism and, and uh, you were thrown into prison. In fact, he was thrown into prison t- twice. Almost starved to death. His, his food was thrown on the floor and he had to, had to fight the rats off to get to it. He was, feet was so badly beaten that, that he, could, he, he could hardly walk the rest of his life. But he escaped Russia, came to America, so excited to be here. And while he was here, he was blessed. Blessed in a great way. Began several businesses. And his testimony was, while he would not bow to the knee of communism, he bowed to the knee of materialism. Materialism ra- ran him away from God. And that's all kind of idols that we, we, we have. We, we even worship men of God and women of God. We even make idols out of them. We, we believe them even when they talk and, and say something contrary to God's word. We, we'll take it from them because, after all, you know, they're, 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 they're special. Listen, you govern everything this man says by the word of God. And if it doesn't jive up with the word of God, you let him know it. You keep me straight. Amen? But there's many ways, idols. That we, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize how much sports was an idol to me until this year when I decided that I was going to uh, 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 boycott every bit of it. And I tell you, it's been hard. When I go home Sunday afternoon, I, I can't even cut the TV on because I know I'm going to be looking for that football. Hello? I, I kid you not. That I, I didn't realize what a, what, how much a, a part of my life, and there's other idols that we worship. Not only materialism, we, we have political idols. We, that we exalt, anything that we exalt above God, anything. Nothing wrong with politics. We need more men of God and women of God in politics. Amen. Nothing wrong with education. Uh, we we need into men with, and women with intellect to, to be uh, apologists with, in God's word. We nothing wrong with money. Nothing you, you know you can't buy food without it. We nothing wrong with having material things and the things that God blesses you with. You, you know I, I, God wants you to use those things for His glory, but don't exalt anything above God, not even His church. Amen. We'll stand for biblical life at conception. Psalms 139, Jeremiah 15, I mean, I mean Jeremiah 1, 5, and Luke 141. We'll stand for God's standards of marriage and family, Matthew 19, 4 through 6. We'll stand against the demons of hell, seeking to destroy the church and our rights as God's children, 1 Timothy 4. We'll stand by the word of our testimony. We'll stand by the blood of the Lamb. We'll overcome by the word and the life that we live, Revelation 12, 11. So the warfare that Paul is teaching us here in 2 Corinthians in the 10th chapter is against the anti-God, anti-Christ culture and society and world that we live in. And you have better be attending a church that is in a, that's raging such war, war, not in agreement with it. Hello? Take a stand. You better not compromise. If not, you may very well be attending an apostate church because Jesus told the church at Pergamos, 
If they did not repent, he will come against them with the sword of his mouth. And that's the word of God. We must take a stand in this anti-God, anti-Christ culture. But now, we want to move on to the sixth chapter of Ephesians and deal with warfare on a more personal level, an individual level. This is the last chapter of the letter to the Ephesian church. And so before we deal with chapter 6, there are some things that we need to have an understanding of in the first five chapters. It needs to be seen. Chapter 6 needs to be seen in context with the rest of this letter that Paul wrote. Now, this book of Ephesians follows a pattern that many of the epistles of the New Testament written by Paul follows. In that in his opening chapters, Paul always deal with the doctrinal with the teachings of the church, with the teachings of Christ. And then later, he'll deal with the relational part of it. You see, you can't know, you you can't know how to live. You can't know how to walk the walk, talk the talk, until you know what the walk is, until you know what the talk is. And so in the book of Ephesians, this is what he does. In the first three chapters, Paul begins to identify our position in Christ defining for what, to us what it means to be a child of God. And so we find in chapter 1, Paul begins by writing to the church that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings, or every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places. He's talking about in the spiritual realm. You see, when we get the blessing in the spiritual realm, we can pull them in the physical realm. Hello? Thank you. I'm glad I'm out there with you. That will be a holy spit. I'll be baptizing a lot of people. So he writes this. He said, now listen, blessed be the God. That word is blessed. How do you spell it? B-L-E-S-S-E-D. Blessed. Blessed be the God and Father. Right away we see the Trinity. And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has. Church, he's not going to do it. Everything that we need as a child of God, He's already did it. He's not going to do anything new. He's already made known to us. He's already given to us. He wants us to walk in the fullness of it. But we've got to learn what the walk is. He says that he has blessed, be the God, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, that is, blessed the church with every spiritual blessing in heaven, in the spiritual realm. Now, notice he used the word blessed twice. And then he uses the word blessing. However, as I mentioned to you before, that many of the words that's translated from the Hebrew and Greek, they had to find the word that best could suit it in context of what he was saying. And so the word blessed here is a different word than the other word that we will see that is blessed. The word blessed here means that it's adoration. It's thankfulness. Thankfulness that we have been saved, as you'll see in a minute. Thankfulness that, that we're part of the church. And, and so he's thanking God that through Jesus Christ, he has provided this. And so he's giving praise. He's adoring the Lord. He, he, he's over, he, you know, he said, blessed be our Father. Praise be our Father. Thankfulness to our Father that he saved us. Thankful to his Father that he found us. Thankful to his Father that he made us part of the church. Thankful that we are fathers of Christ. Thankful for who we believe in. And so he said, blessed is our Father, because he has blessed us. Then the word bless here is a different word. This word translated bless here means he's caused us to prosper in God, in the spirit realm. He's given us favor with God in the spirit realm. He's done so by his Brighten us and blessing us with every spiritual blessing. And that word spiritual blessing here means that everyone who is now filled with and governed by the Spirit of God, he will prosper. Everyone who is filled with the Spirit of God and who, who are under God's government, under God's rulership, under, uh, have made Jesus Christ his Lord, he will bless them. He will prosper them. Everyone who is governed by the Spirit of God. Then he goes to verse 4. And this morning I I had them to count from verse 4 to verse 14. There's 10 verses. 4, 5, 6, 7. Read all 14 verses. 
You teachers out there, I want you to realize that those 10 verses from 4 to 14 is all one sentence. It's one sentence. He says, we've been chosen from before the foundation of the world. He's made us holy and blameless before him. He's telling us before creation that he knew about you and I being the church. He said, before Satan fell and before Adam and Eve sinned, he knew what was going to take place. He knows all things. But he kept the church a mystery because it's the church that's going to be the bride of Christ, that's going to be the wife of Christ. It's the church that he reveals now in the New Testament. It's the church that he will use to reign and to rule with him in the millennial reign that we'll be in charge of the politics. We'll be in charge of government. We'll be in charge of the health care system. We'll be in charge of education. We'll be, we will be in charge of the church under his leadership and his call of theocracy. God will rule. But until then... He expects us to begin to operate and to learn to operate in that authority now. That's why we need to fill our schools and universities with Christian teachers. Why we need to vote for men of God who best stand. They might not be the most perfect people and not going to be. They may not even be saved because if you remember, Daniel was blessed in favor of God under three different evil kings. Three different princes, polities, three different nations under the rule of Satan, and yet God favored Daniel, gave him favor in the government, gave him favor among those rulers. And God can take wicked men, even today, and use them to give us favor here in America to practice the Christian principles that God has given us. He can do it. We need to pray. We need to pray. He, he said he loved that he predestined the church so that we had been adopted as a son as a daughter of God through Jesus Christ. Do you know what it means to be adopted? Let me tell you. In the Jewish culture, your son or your daughter can do wickedly. And they can be banished from your family forever. They can be disowned. That name removed from the, your birth certificate, moved from the record. You no longer exist as far as they are concerned under the Jewish law with their children. However, under the Jewish law, if you are adapted, adapted to that family, you can never, never be disowned. We've been adapted into the family of God. We're his sons and daughters. He'll never disown us. We're his. And it says so in verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. And the grace he lavished on us, not on how important we are, not on how pretty we are. Amen. I tell you what, we just, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to heaven on my looks, Bob. It's just not going to happen. And he goes on to state, furthermore, I like that furthermore. He has given us revelation in that all the wisdom and the insight that was hitting hidden, has now been made known to us, and that involves the mystery of his will in that which was formerly hidden, even in the Old Testament, is now revealed to us. And now we are able, through the revelation, that means the rhema of Scripture, to understand not only the past as it was given to us, but now we can understand the present, what we are as a church, and then also the fullness of the times, the summing up of all things that we'll have in Christ Jesus for all eternity. And this is what he said. He said, it's things, a matter of things in heaven and things upon the earth. And now we have attained an eternal inheritance to which we, that is his church, have been predestined. It was his purpose from the very beginning, and he sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise, verse 13. In other words, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. It's the engagement we're in. We're just waiting for the wedding of the bride. It's the down payment. And Paul starts out with this long list of staggering benefits and blessings that belong to us because we belong to Christ. And then Paul prays that we'll understand those benefits. He goes in verse 18. He said, Lord, let the eyes of our heart be enlightened to know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the surpassing power that has been extended to us, the working of his might. You know what that word might mean? means his ability. 
His ability to accomplish it. His ability to get it done. I'm so glad that the church don't have to depend upon its might. But that if we walk in obedience to Christ, God, His ability will bring us through. And so he says, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead resides in us. He assures that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead, is seated somewhere. And is in heavenly places at his right hand. Now, I want you need to underline this because this will really come to play when we get over in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, when we talk about the honor of God. Because he goes on to say that Jesus, listen, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Let me see that again. Far above all rule and authority and a power and dominion, both spiritual and in this world. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And everything, listen, it says, has been put in subjection under his feet because he's the head of everything. Now, the reason for sharing this today is I want you to keep that in mind when we get to, to the sixth chapter and talk about uh, rule, authority, power, dominion. Because Paul uses these words again in chapter 6, and you'll see clearly when he uses these words, he's referring to demonic powers. So here in chapter 1, we're told from the get-go that among the benefits and the blessings that belong to Christ is that Jesus is not on the head of all things. He's the head of all things given to the church. And that Jesus is over all demonic power and principalities and the forces of hell. And then when we get down to... Uh, I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because in a minute you're going to see, and, and that's why we're seated. That's why we're seated. See, many of you know Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I got three minutes. I got to hurry. Matthew 18, I mean 28, 18 through 20, we've read it over and over again. But remember, it's written in English. Translated in English, rather. Not written in English, but translated in English. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me. In heaven and earth, go ye. Do you know what that go ye means? It means a transference. Something has been transferred. In the original context, Jesus has said, all the power, all the authority of heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore I'm tra transferring it over to you. Go ye. And make disciples of all nations. Baptize the name in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost Spirit. And, the, and, and, and it says that uh, wherever we are, the, he'll go with us. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. That word earth shall be age, even to the end of the age. Talking about the church age. Paul, I mean, Mark clarifies it a little bit more. He, he goes in a little bit more detail in Mark, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. He said, Go ye out of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Are you glad you're a believer? He that believeth not is damned. And then he said, Look, this authority you have, and these are signs that are going to follow you because you have this authority in my name. You shall cast out devils, demons. In my name, you shall speak in new languages. In my name, you shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. In my name, you shall drink, if you shall drink any poison, any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. In my name, you shall tread over scorpions and serpents. Now, I told the church earlier today, when you read that, that's in the spiritual sense. That doesn't mean that we go out hunting snakes. You bring a snake through that door, I'm going out that door. You bring a serpent through that door, and that door, both together, I'm going to make a door right there. I, I don't have that faith. I don't call it faith. I call it foolishness. I call it not knowing the truth and walking in the truth. Amen. But in his original context, Jesus is transferring to his followers this authority that's been given to him. And then in chapter 2, Paul describes the wonderful gift of salvation, reminding us that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins, but we have been made alive. And then guess what he says in verse 5? Now, remember what he says over in verse 1, that all authority, all power, everything has been given unto him. He's the head of all things. And then Paul says this. He said that we're the church, his bride. We've been made alive together with Christ by grace. We are what? Raised up with him. To that resurrection. We are seated with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. That's our position, church. That's our position. And in the ages to come, he's going to show the surprising, surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us 
in Christ Jesus. We are seated with Christ. Why is Christ seated? Above all principalities, above all powers, above all things of the world. You and I, have, we walk and live in that authority. We don't have to back up to the devil. We don't have to fear those principalities and powers. We have been given the authority as a church to stand against the ungodliness of this, this generation. It's time that we take a stand against this anti-God, this anti-Christ culture. It's time that we, the church, rise up and not be afraid to speak what we believe, that we're against the killing of our babies, that we're against the, 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 the destroying of the family unit. Jesus said that it's uh, one husband, one man, and one wife. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That he uh, gives us perverting what God created us to be. I'm going to tell you something. If you have female DNA, that's what you are. You have male DNA, that's what you are. And you don't need to be ashamed of what you are. God created you to be a woman. You walk tall and high because God exalted you. He made you the crown of man. And you're important. And, and man, we need not to neglect the authority that God's given us to walk in the authority and be the priest over our homes. Amen? So, and my time's in, it hasn't. It? But folks, in chapter 3, he defines some of these blessings. Begin to tell to we his workmanship in verse 10, that we have been creating Christ Jesus for good works. I wish I had time to go through all of this. But the result of our being saved is that we do those works that pleases God. That's the key. Not what pleases man. Which pleases God. You know, we used to be excluded from the purposes and the plans of God because we're not Jews. But now, he includes both Jew and Gentile in the church. And then chapter 2 ends, and then he goes into chapter 3. And there he writes about the wonderful privilege that's been given to us as a steward, as ministers of the gospel. He said, even though I'm the least of all saints, in verse 8, he says, still I was chosen as an apostle to bring the, to you Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ to bring all these things to light. And I don't have time to go through all that. I'm just hitting some highlights. In chapter 3, he teaches us that we, what we're all about and what belong to us in belonging to Christ. And he tells us, I, I, I mean, you know, here's the thing. He goes through these first three chapters, and they're doctrinal. But he's so excited over the teachings of God. He gets so excited over who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ. He can't go on any further. He has to stop. You ever been there when you've been praying and everything and thinking about the goodness of God? Or you've been in church and you just felt the goodness and so forth? God, that you, you just had to stop for a minute. And you know what he does? He stops. I mean, he just stops. And he has an outburst of doxology, of praise and worship. All of a sudden, he's saying, now to him who is able to exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. He gets so excited, he has to stop and worship. And then it goes from the doctrinal to telling us how to walk and live that which we are taught. In other words, he's saying, now you've got to learn how to walk the walk. You know how to talk the talk. Now walk the talk. And now, in the next several chapters, he begins to deal with practical ways that you and I, as the children of God, are to deal with this anti-God culture. How we are to deal with our family relationships, with our children, with husbands and wives. How we are to deal with with our neighbors and co-workers and so forth, and how that we are not to have the communication of the world, but we are to talk that which is holy and righteous. And we are to live that way. We're not to live as we, how the world lives. And he describes that in detail. And then, and here's how he does it. In his typical fashion, after he has come to the end of that which is doctrinal, he said, therefore, chapter 4, therefore, we need to walk the practical. See, in Hosea, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse, God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge because we don't know the walk. Jesus said to Matthew 22, 29, you do err if you don't know the walk. You don't know the scriptures, nor the power of God. And I told you what that power of God is, the supernatural power of God that transforms our lives. 
The reason that you have stopped sinning and doing the things that you used to do is not you. God did it in you. Paul, he, he speaks about things that they do in the world that the, those are, who are sinners now do. He talks about the adultery and the fornication. He talks about the gossiping. He talks about the wickedness, about stealing, all these things. He said, but now, at one time you were those, but you're not no more because you learned to walk the walk, not just enjoy the talk. And he goes on to saying, you see, uh, it, beginning in verse 4, that we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to what we have been called. That sums it up. Walk the talk. See, in the first three chapters, God has given all these things to us. This is our position in Christ and all of this that now belongs to us because we now belong to Christ. And now that we know who we are and what belongs to us, now we are, what is required of us is to walk in fulfilling what we have been taught. So he writes, we are to walk in a way that is consistent with our calling. That means humility, gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, diligently preserving the unity of the Spirit. And then in the, subsequent, the, the next several verses, he says, we've been graced according to the measure of Christ's gift. So make sure that we know how to use that grace. And then he tells us how we ought to submit to the authority of the church and so forth. Well, that's so much. We have so little time to share it. But realize we have done warfare with this anti-God, anti-culture. We must take a stand. Amen. And now we must take a stand in walking and fulfilling the purpose of God in our life as the church. And because of that, there's going to be some tremendous warfare. Because here's what he's saying. How many of you have ever enjoyed a casual walk? You know, you get out there, you know, it's nice and cool, and you're just enjoying the breeze, man. you just kind of, hey, you know, just, you're just enjoying that, you know, that walk. You can, hey, uh, it's not going to be that walk. He said, this walk is not going to be easy. There's going to be some hardship that accompany it with this walk. We don't, we don't hear a lot about that these days, do we? Yeah, he wants to bless us, but he wants to let us know that when you begin to take a stand, Jesus said, what? I've come to divide families, to set sword our brothers against sisters, and moms against dads, and so why? Because there'll be those who refuse to walk. You might be persecuted on the job. You might be persecuted your family for the standard that you raised up to stand in. And you know what we have to do? Love them. We don't debate them. We don't argue with them. We don't try to prove them wrong. That's in the natural, the flesh. We get over in the spirit realm. The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God. God can change a person's heart, not you. And here's something else. You can't, please stop trying to figure out what another person is thinking. Mm -mm, you can't do it. Jesus said nobody, Jeremiah, the prophet said that nobody knows man's heart but him. I, I can't read minds. I can tell you there have been things that, that, that uh, I will tell you that as a pastor, there have been times when people wanted to come and talk with me, and I begin to think of the worst of things. Oh, no, they're going to come. They want to speak about this. They're going to talk about this. I just said, and when they come, it has nothing to do with that. It has something to do with what they're struggling. So we can't read minds. We can't know what they're thinking. Sometimes when they act it out, we can know. And sometimes they're very brutal in acting it out. Amen? They are. Sick Jesus on them. Sick Jesus on them. Return love. Let's have peace. Amen? Amen. Thank you for coming today. Father, we just thank you for those who was in the... Uh, parking lot, those who are on the inside and those who are watching us, uh, Father, uh, through the media and so forth. God, we trust that the word we gave today will be a, a word of revelation, a word of blessing, that it would encourage them, instruct them, and help them to realize that that purpose in the church and how that we can overcome evil with good and how we can overcome the principalities and the powers that will come against us. But we need 
your full armor. We need it. We can't leave off one piece. All of it works together. And Lord, when we leave off a piece or two, then God, we get in trouble. We get wounded. So Father, help us to learn what this whole armor is, how to worry. Now I pray today for those who listen to the sound of my voice. They've never found Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've never, they've been, some have even been in church, been brought up in church. But someone is pricking their heart today. Someone is speaking to them and saying, today is the day of salvation. And I pray, Lord, as you're speaking to them, that they will turn their lives over to you. Not to a church, not to a denomination, not to a man, not to a woman, but to you, O oh Father. They will confess their sins, ask you to come into their life, turn them around. They go in the opposite direction than what they're heading. Give them a name written in heaven. Salvation through Jesus Christ. I pray today, Father, for all who are listening, who are lost, come to realization they're lost. They will receive you as Lord and Savior. Amen.